Welcome to the Market Me podcast with your host, Mike Mall. Each episode of Market Me deconstructs real campaigns for actual businesses to improve their marketing efforts. Mike is the founder of Social Media House and a digital marketing consultant who teaches marketing strategy to executives and their teams from small business to Fortune 500 companies. Let's get started. All right, today we're talking with Justin Hugh from Yup. And you got that right, it's Yup. That's right. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for joining us, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I'm more than happy to. So uh, tell, us, tell us about your business. Yeah, so Yup is a personal finance management platform for mobile. Uh, what we're doing is we're connecting our users to their multiple bank accounts so that they can be more mindful about the spending that they're doing, gain insights into, into the, their spending behavior, and ultimately find the products, the financial products that will work best for them and their, their holistic financial picture. Got it. So break that down a little bit. Tell me a little bit more specific about what that means. Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I guess I, one of the places we can start is sort of with the problem that we're trying to solve here. Uh, I mean, the way that I found this business and, and my, my, uh, my co-founders and my partners here, um, we were tapping into a problem that we see growing uh, and a couple of trends that we're seeing feeding into that problem. Uh, that problem is that in Canada and, and in the U.S., roughly three quarters of people are spending unsustainably. So that means that the money that they're making is going directly into uh, expenditures, they're buying clothes, they're buying cars, whatever else it is, um, and they're not actually saving any money. And in tandem with that, roughly a quarter of Canadians and, uh, and Americans are actually in poor financial health. So we see a trend where they don't have the behavior that's gonna put them in a great place, and their current health is no good. So where does that leave them in the future? Um, it also sort of, uh, my, my own personal uh, story factors into this a little bit. I come as a first generation immigrant uh, to Canada. And when my parents first arrived to the country, they were immediately uh, met with some personal financial troubles. They came here from Jamaica as late teens, uh, got married very quickly and had four kids. And so financial troubles were there from right off the bat. Uh, and when I talk to them now, uh, 40 years later, when they're uh, about to retire, having put four kids through university, and I ask them, how did you make it through those years? And how did you achieve your financial goals? Their answer was, we talked about it every single day. We talked about the coupons that we'd clip. We talked about what we were making at work, whether we were spending too much on tomatoes when we go to the grocery store. Um, and when it becomes a part of the daily conversation, your habits really, really do stay in check. And so that's what we're trying to do with Yuck. Um, we're trying to create uh, an accessible tool to Canadians and Americans that allows them to really gain this visibility into where's my money going? And this is a problem that's becoming more and more difficult as it becomes easier and easier to spend money. So I know for myself, I have a Spotify subscription, I have a Netflix subscription, I'm being charged bank fees from the three different institutions that I use. Um, I uh, have deposits that are being placed onto the credit cards that I'm using when I stay at uh, hotels for business travel, um, and I'm worried about fraud. Uh, so there's all these different things that are kind of occurring on my accounts that are sort of invisible to me. And in tandem with all that, there's all my personal financial habits that I need to control and understand and, and um, see how it can improve. Uh, and, and in the market today, we don't think that there is a tool that really makes this a day-to-day -day habit building exercise. And so that's really the, the thing that we're trying to tackle here. Yeah, I love that. You yeah. know, I think, I think, you know, I taught, I know a lot of different business owners and people and just, you know, friends and acquaintances. And I think that conversation around money is like yeah. really taboo in a lot of households around in a lot of cultures. It's like, yeah. you don't ask. And then you like, look back, your parents, like never being able to ask like mine were fine. Like you could, you could ask, they had, a, they had an answer or they didn't. But uh, I know a lot of people where they like could ask about something is like, no, no, you don't ask people about your, their finances. And they're like, right. okay, well, how am I supposed to know what to do then? Like that doesn't right. make any sense. And so I think it's, I think the problem is rampant. And I think, you know, it, you're right, you know, with, you know, especially in the U S with tools like Venmo and all these things where you can like text message people money. Now um, it's really easy to have outbound um, and then not, not be able to match it up with what's coming in. So tell me a little bit about how the product actually does, how, how does it function, how does it work? Yeah, sure. So right now we're available on the app store. We started with uh, iOS first um, to, to sort of validate our product. Um, so uh, you can find us on the app store if you just kind of search Yup, we'll be probably the number one result there. Um, and you would install the application, you would be prompted with a screen that allows you to select the banks that you're using. So we support 10,000 institutions in the States and the top 30 over here in Canada. You link them up using the same uh, 
information that you would use on the online portals uh, for those banks' websites. Uh, and then we begin to send you notifications for whenever transactions occur on those connected accounts. So whenever you're charged to that bank fee from TD, for example, or whenever that subscription uh, charge comes in for, for Netflix. Um, through those notifications, our users are staying on top of um, those accounts. And right there on their lock screen, they're able to verify the category that, that uh, we're guessing that that transaction occurs for, the vendor amount, the vendor name, and so forth. And they're able to yup their transactions right there on the lock screen just by depressing and uh, hitting confirm uh, on that purchase. Um, when you go into the application itself, uh, there is uh, a number of views. The first one is a dashboard, which shows you the transactions you have not addressed yet. The second one is a historical ledger, which allows you to uh, search or filter through your previous purchases. Um, that's kind of my favorite one where I can see how much I've been spending on McDonald's. It's a little bit embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> uh, it gives me the, the visibility into this, right? Um, and finally, insights, uh, an insights page, which shows uh, which shows you in, in a nice kind of colorful way, um, you've been spending X number of dollars on entertainment, X number of dollars on food and drink, and so forth. Um, and yeah, and the, one, of the, one of the things that our, our users are really loving about the application is the fact that they're getting these notifications. It keeps them in uh, that conversation of their personal finances every single day. It, it keeps them in touch with how much money is in their accounts, uh, how much they're spending, and um, and what they're being charged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think now is a time more than ever where, uh, you know, budgeting, you know, I, well, the podcast won't be released at the same time, but uh, obviously there's a lot of issues right now around job yeah. cuts and, and people having to be on a budget because uh, of the, the health situation that's going on. But um, yeah. so how, so there's, there's a couple other products on the marketplace that are like this. How, how do you think about yourself in terms of point of differentiation? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that we think that, the uh, the pseudo competitors in the space are really really missing out on is our relentless focus on day to day finances. So there's a number of other uh, budgeting platforms that'll they'll help you uh, understand what you're spending and um, you know what you earn and whether uh, over the course of a month whether you're spending unsustainably. But if we kind of go back to the story that I told a little bit earlier about how to actually make differences in your day to day habits that affect uh, your financial health. We believe that this needs to be a day-to-day -day, uh, experience. You need to be right there with the heartbeat of your finances, understanding if I'm spending too much on coffee, uh, or maybe I shouldn't have purchased that sweater from the Gap uh, the other day. And so our whole experience is crafted around this idea that you need to understand on a day-to-day -day basis where your money is going. Uh, step one is our ability to provide these notifications for whenever transactions are occurring on your multiple accounts in a single place. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's 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 kind of the main focus. Uh, the different point of differentiation there is uh, this relentless focus on the day to day spending. Do you have any fears or any like considerations for the fact that you know some people have embarrassment around it and they don't mm -hmm. want to be facing these things? I mean, I guess you're always going to have a segment that you don't appeal to. But have you thought about that at all in terms of like the people like someone who who buys because they're anxious and who automatically feels that buyer's remorse or they're like I don't need to be reminded again um, <laughs> have, have you thought about ways to kind of help them or is that kind of like you need to actually be in the right headspace and understand that you should be budgeting to use the yeah. app or yeah well it's a little bit of both I, I think there's definitely that persona out there I think that embarrassment is is definitely very real um, and that's part of the reason that the messaging and the copy inside the application is the way that it is uh, we found that a lot of other apps really are kind of wrist slappy, right? If you spend over your budget, there's this big red uh, alert that comes across your phone and says you've been naughty. Um, mm -hmm. If you keep doing this, then um, you're, you're gonna be out of money in, in a couple of, of weeks and so forth. So we're very consciously taking a step back from at least that level of scolding our users. Uh, it, it drives people away, it's just not a great experience. And so our focus is first on, okay, you spend a certain way. Um, you, you buy these things and these things and these things, we just think that you should know what you're actually spending. And the decision that you make, uh, whether uh, to reduce the spending or whether to increase the spending or to save more, that all kind of, re that relies on you. That re that's something that should be self-motivated and it won't be something that will make an opinion of uh, right out the gates. Uh, so that's, in terms of the app experience, how we're tackling that issue and, uh, and thriving on the fact that a lot of other apps are missing out on the fact that you shouldn't be doubling down on the embarrassment of your user. It can kind of create yeah. that negative experience. But in tandem with that, we're also uh, running a, a blog on our website. And uh, we think that a huge 
part of our job here is to educate our users, uh, whether that's in personal finance, whether that's in positivity and mindfulness as well. Um, because as you said, uh, finances, I think for a long time have been sort of viewed with a negative light, but we view them we view personal finances as a very empowering thing. Um, you have much more control over your personal finances than you think. Um, and there is a way to be level-headed about it and to approach it with positivity and mindfulness as well. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I've been seeing, um, particularly on YouTube recent, like in the last maybe 18 months, is a lot more open conversation about it. There's these, um, you know, these series where it's like, I'm a, this profession in this city making this amount, and here's where I spend every dime. And they do videos, yeah. like literally breaking down every single piece. So I think there's a lot more, I think the next generation uh, is kind of like, okay, wait, why wouldn't we want to learn this? Like even, yeah. even the fact that they don't offer courses and stuff about it in school, I think even universities are starting to like open up programs of like how to do your taxes. Here's how to yeah. like do practical things. I know a lot of the, um, I know a lot of the sports programs in the U S because it's like, they know they're just going straight to the NBA or the NFL. That's yeah. what they're trying to do or trying to just say, okay, here's some practical skills instead of trying to take basket weaving or some bullshit math class. You're not going to sit through. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a big shift uh, towards people being more open to it. And I think mm -hmm. it's a, it's a great time to do it. So um, obviously you come with a bit of a background, you've thought through this product, you've thought through budgeting, you've obviously have been, you grew up in a really positive ecosystem around that conversation. What would you say to somebody um, right now, or just in general, somebody like, what are kind of the, some of the top ways? I mean, obviously downloading your app is a great way, but you know, taking away from the like taking away from the product piece what, what are some things that you see you know whether it's from the data you're seeing or the trends that you're seeing or the conversations with your customers that you're seeing like what are some ways that people could think about money and budgeting that they probably aren't doing now like what are some of the common mistakes you're seeing yeah well i would say that step number one and whether it's through use of our app or not i think the starting place has to be taking stock of what your personal finances are where are you spending your money what's your what's your income what are your fixed costs and so forth um, to make the right decisions for yourself, you definitely need to take stock of, of, uh, of what you've got going on. I'm going to restart that. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Um, yeah, I think as a starting point, the most important thing is to take stock of where your personal finances are, what you earn, what you spend your money on and what your habits are and understanding, um, am I financially healthy? Is this sustainable? Um, am I spending on things that don't matter, that don't make me happy, that don't, uh, that aren't a part of my necessary day-to-day -day life. Um, and I mean, there's, there's a wealth of, of, uh, of education out there for personal finance um, uh, that, that you can use to kind of help understand your specific uh, scenario and, and how to improve that. But I, I think there is a sort of resistance, I would say, to that first step of, of kind of uncovering, okay, how healthy am I or how unhealthy am I? And that, that has to be the first step to, to understand yeah. where you currently stand. Um, so that, that would be at the number one for me. Yeah. Do you have any tools or resources that come to mind when you, you said, you know, there's a bunch of different things out there. I mean, I'm, I would imagine you guys, you know, took a look through the marketplace and looked mm -hmm. at who's publishing content around this. Is there anyone mm -hmm. that stood out to you as like maybe like a, a way to get started or an entry point for people? Yeah. I, I like to touch on a variety of uh, resources. So I think one of the things that uh, is interesting to me is I'm a bit of a Redditor. So I like the Reddit personal finance uh, subreddit. And, and what's nice about it is that you get a wealth of different voices that are adding to the conversation. And so you're not, you're not aligning yourself with a specific uh, method uh, or, or ideology when it comes to personal finances, but really kind of taking stock of uh, the many options that are available to you. And I, I think that's a great way uh, to, to approach that because I don't think there's going to be a one size fits all answer to how you should spend every, uh, every single dollar or how you should budget or what's the right amount or, or even necessarily uh, what, what is the, the right account for me at, at this current moment. Um, but I, I think educating yourself and, and uh, doing the legwork that it takes to understand what your options are um, and how those might affect your current situation is probably the best thing that, that can be done. Yeah, interesting. But I've never heard of the the Reddit, so the Reddit, <laughs> okay, kind of cool. Um, yeah. So where do you see the product going? So you can kind of go in, take stock of where you are, make a bit of a plan, set some budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, where where are you kind of going? What's your kind of end game with this? Yeah, sure. So it's our viewpoint that there needs to be as it's it's our view. 
it's our viewpoint that as globally, we're building more relationships with more financial institutions and it's becoming easier and easier to do so, that there needs to be a universal remote for your personal finances, right? So we, we start very much on the visualization side. We help people to see where their money is going and so forth. Um, but down the road, years in the future, we hope to also be able to move money for our users. If there was a uh, button inside the application that says pay all bills and, and um, we can, we can uh, manage your finances from a single place, that would be the future that we're, we're tending towards. In the nearer future, uh, we're trying to have uh, uh, the ability for our users to find the financial products that represent the greatest value to them for their specific financial behaviors. And that's something that we're really ex excited about because uh, the app is able to tell you you're spending a lot on entertainment or you're spending a lot on food and drink. Uh, there's a number of credit card issuers that are, are offering rewards for, for these various types of expenditures. Uh, so in the near future, what we're, what we're uh, building out is um, product recommendations for our user, use, uh, pardon me, product recommendations for our users based on their specific habits that would generate them more value compared to necessarily the products that they're using uh, at, the, at the moment. Got it. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, I know. I I shopped around quite a bit because we had to take a look. Like we took a deep dive, at, especially like from a business expense standpoint. Yeah. Um, it, there's like there's so many. There's a huge variety of options, and I think with the cards and the so we did a mix of of cash back and points. Yeah. Um, but you know we earned somewhere around four thousand dollars in cash back last year yeah just, like we were really optimized and it was like fantastic it just actually just went onto the credit card to pay off stuff and i was like oh this is great yeah. i mean i would love to have four thousand cash but whatever uh, <laughs> yeah. but no it was yeah so i, I agree and I, I think there was a number of years and a big period of time where even from my personal side i was probably on the wrong credit products um mm. and then even like moving outside of your bank and seeing what's offered directly from a visa or a mastercard rather than like you know the scotia bank or the rbc or maybe yeah. moving over actually makes sense so yeah it's, it's crazy how many different things are out there and i think in the u.s more so than canada there's like a wider range and a lot more diverse things mm -hmm. uh, in terms of product offerings but yeah i think it's a great segue in for you guys yeah and i think for for the most part there is a lack of awareness of, of what's actually out there and and i think as you said like a lot of people the way that they get their first credit card is that they ended up with a bank account at the, the same institution that their parents were at and uh, they get rolled into the products that that institution offers. But there are so many options out there that are willing to, uh, to provide you value um, that could outpace what you're currently using. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I know, it's, I know we cheated a little bit because we did have lunch already about a month ago talking about you know, marketing and strategy, but yeah. how, how are you guys thinking about uh, just for them to bring value back to the, the audience uh, how um, how are you guys thinking about marketing have uh, you know is there some of the stuff that we talked about that was implemented I know um, you know you were kind of in the early stages which is always mm -hmm. a challenge for an app where there's no monetization on the front end so yeah yeah, what yeah absolutely think? yeah so uh, I think a big topic in the conversation that you and I had was how to think about uh, our digital marketing channels and how to squeeze the most value out of that so Certainly one of the things that I did, I sprinted back to my office after a conversation and, was, and took another look at our, our campaigns and tried to, um, you know, uh, run a couple more split tests and, and find the, the best creative and, and more importantly, kind of just get in the mindset of always squeezing as, as much value out of those channels as possible. But another thing that we, uh, that we also discussed during that lunch um, that we tried playing around with is the idea that we need to find more channel partners. Um, or uh, more referral uh, opportunities as well. And so following that, we've begun uh, speaking to entrepreneurship blogs, uh, student groups, personal finance, uh, bloggers, and so forth. And we've had a couple of features in, in the meantime uh, that talk about either my own entrepreneurship journey or the, uh, the, the, the product itself and how it can help people uh, manage their personal finances. And through those uh, those conversations and those partnerships, we've been able to leverage the audiences of uh, some, uh, I guess you could, would call them influencers or uh, um, or bloggers and so forth, and really represent value to their to their audience. But at the same time, uh, kind of amplify our own voice. And so that I think is probably one of the most uh, exciting things that that came of the conversation that we had with you. Um, and in terms of uh, what we're spending on on seeing those opportunities out. Uh, it represents a drastic uh, amount of saving compared to just spent, you know, drilling uh, extra dollars into Google AdWords or so forth. So uh, yeah. that's one of the things that we're really excited about. And we're hoping over the next uh, 
a couple months or so to really kind of um, accelerate those operations as well, uh, because they've they've represented some some decent improvements in the short term. It's still yeah, very much it, an experimental phase, but um, but we're very excited. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that are creating great content. Um, you know, I think I don't know if you reach out to that Mike um, Mike guy the the personal finance guy out of New Jersey that has the the show there. I mean, he you know he's a he was on my podcast maybe like uh, maybe fifteen twenty episodes ago. I don't even know where okay. we're at how many we've recorded, but um, you know where he his main business focuses on servicing high net worth individuals. Right. And all he has is the education portal. You know, you guys are that great channel partner for him to say, mm-hmm. hey, and we have this great group that actually can help you manage your stuff b- beyond just me giving you this content. And so, yeah, I think it's a really, um, I think it's a really good play for you guys because, uh, yeah, at buying ads, the, the cost never goes down that much. It right. does to an extent, but it, it hits a floor of you know, growth. Whereas like it, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the potential as much to go viral or for like the big word of mouth push, because I saw an ad, I was interested. I downloaded it. I'm not telling my friend, but I saw it from a guy that I already trust and I love it. I'm telling my friends and family because I got it from somebody I trusted, not just from a sponsored post on Instagram. So I think it has a lot more word of mouth capability for sure. I love that. If you were in, in my position, I'm wondering how you would think about this. Would you basically stall all uh, digital advertisement operations and, and kind of really drill 100% of your, your focus and your effort into um, driving those channel partnerships? Or would you kind of have a baseline of, of digital advertising running in, in the background and, and try and supplement that with, with these? I, I always have a base and if nothing else, should have a system of retargeting. Cause you're going to get people that come through these channel partners that land on the site that, you know, they're, they're like, they land, they're on their phone. They're like, Oh, actually this, this does sound great. And then something happens. I'm at work. My boss comes, I gotta put my phone down or my kids are screaming and I got to leave the room. And like mm-hmm. you, you, when you, when you lose their attention, you know how many, you know how people end up with like a bunch of different tabs. I was on my Safari Chrome on my, or my Safari browser on here. And I've got like 19 things that I like I started. And then I just put the phone down and I never went yeah. back to, and I, and I try and keep that as little as possible, but most people end up with all these tabs and then they, the, the once you're trying to minimize them, you're like, Oh, I don't care what this was. I don't remember what yeah. this was It's really yeah. easy to forget. And so I think at bare minimum having retargeting through Google, YouTube, display advertising, Instagram, Facebook ads, retargeting of people that came onto the site, is a must is a bare minimum because no matter if, even if you got that click to your website for cheaper, you still had to find the person, reach out, communicate with them, make a plan, make sure they felt comfortable with the product, negotiate whatever you negotiated with them. Like there's still costs associated with traffic. Traffic mm-hmm. always costs money. There's no way around it. So when you paid your either time and effort or an intern's effort or actually paid the money to post about it, that traffic costs money and to leave that traffic without any further communication, um, I think it would be a, would be a mistake. So at minimum retargeting. And I mean, here's the thing, right? If you end up running a, like on Google, like interstitial app ads on Google and you're getting downloads for eight cents and you see that the traffic coming through them is sticky, then load it up. Right. I always think it's worth, I always think it's worth testing some of your budget in those, online ad areas because again even if they don't have the virality piece uh you may find a sweet spot like we were down we were generating lead we were generating leads on like a download this pdf campaign for like 28 cents and they were like really 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 highly qualified people and i was like just keep just keep going just keep like get it as big (laughs) as you can right you 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 run into some ad campaigns where the opportunity is just too good to pass up Um, But at minimum, I would say to maintain a retargeting effort of, you know, case studies and video testimonials and, hey, don't forget us, come back, like value proposition style posts for people that have been to the landing page but didn't convert, you should be driving to them. And within those campaigns, because you have a conversion action, they go to the app store or whatever, if they've done that, then you eliminate them from targeting. So it's like people that came and didn't do this are getting the ads. 
anybody that came and did this get excluded from the ads because you don't want right. to bother people once they've signed up. Yeah. So I would I would say that that at bare minimum for the for the digital ads. Um, but I, I would suggest creating some sort of referral platform for mm -hmm. people that do sign up. Um, one way I'm thinking about that, whether you've got the tools or you use um, an existing software, like um, uh, there's one called viral hyphen loops. There's mm -hmm. another one called Viper, V Y P E R. Viper is really cool actually. So they sign up, it creates them a unique URL a referral URL and then you can incentivize them by saying like, Hey, if you get 10 people to sign up for our free app, we'll give you X. Now in the early stages, it's hard to say what that giveaway, that prize what that thing should be. Um, yeah. For me, I give away consulting time cause it's like, it's just my time. But if you eventually find out that, you know, for every 10 users, it's worth this much revenue to you and you can work backwards from monetizing it. Then you right. can say, oh, well, I'll give away a $50 gift card if you sign up 10 people. And or like a pre or if you've got, you know, if you've got an upsell to a premium version of the app or some incentive to get people on board. Um, and this might be where the channel partner thing comes in handy, right? So right. if you've got other small business entities or you have, um, you know, money, people that like financial advisors or other like tools or software that people might use coordinating with them and saying, Hey, if I get this many people, could I give away a free something of yours? Then you bring right. someone into your ecosystem and then you can kind of kind of do what you want with them. You can have them into your referral network now. So mm -hmm. I think as you're having conversations with channel partners, especially if they've got like either ability to do consulting or they have um, an informational product or a really low ticket, like a SaaS product or something, um, those are the, those are the things that are really easy to like give away low margin, but people get excited. Right. Oh, if I can get 10 people to sign up, then I get whatever that thing is. And then you actually have a reason to do it. Um, you know, Dropbox did it really well. Uber and Lyft did it really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there's some pages from their book of like, you know, something that doesn't cost you anything or doesn't cost you much. But if you say, hey, if you love this, we want to help other people with their money. Like it's, it's a really wholesome intent as well. It's not just right. like, hey, get someone else to buy our shit. It's like, no, no, like, <laughs> get someone else to be able to manage their finances better. So you come at it from a wholesome approach. I think a referral program would be really smart um, yeah. for you guys. I like that thinking too. It, it kind of turns uh, the channel partnerships into a double-edged sword as well. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. And I think as you gain usership, like if you, if you're creating high quality content and your existing users are opening emails from you on a regular basis, I mean, there's so much monetization opportunity from that standpoint of, Hey, channel partner, who's a financial advisor. Um, why don't I feature you in our, uh, our upcoming newsletter or feature a piece of content or your lead magnet? Like you can, you know, as soon as you get past like 5,000 people on your email list, and if you have a reasonable open rate and level of attentiveness on your email list, like that's already a weapon. Um, and you can really leverage that for, again, whether you say, Hey, give me, give me 10 free subscriptions to this or give away a sweater or a backpack or, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. makes sense for your audience. It has to be right for the people that are downloading the app. Uh, it could be a prepaid Visa gift card, those types of things. Although Visa is not going to part you easily but, <laughs> but uh finding those opportunities that something that would serve your audience well um those people are always looking to siphon audience to siphon attention so similar the way you're doing with the channel partners as long as you're equally bringing value to the table Great. um easy to get a yes under yeah. those circumstances and i think that that referral growth could be massive 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 for you yeah i love that I wanted to, you said something that was really interesting to me there um, that I, I'm curious how you would approach uh, as a startup with a limited marketing budget. So you, you mentioned um, finding kind of a pocket of value with your PDF leads. Um, I wonder if you had um, a startup that kind of was asking you, okay, we're looking for finding the same similar pockets of value as well. We have a restricted uh, advertising budget, but we want to do some work and trying to find uh, similar value. Where would be, what would be the starting point for you uh, for, for that, uh, that company? In terms of the content I would recommend? Yeah. Or, or which channels to look into and, and you know, uh, how much attention to, to give each of them to, to try and find uh, something similar. 
Yeah, I mean, I think with any early stage startup, especially in technology, there's yeah. always going to be a there's always going to be a need to be nimble and pivot. As you've mm-hmm. probably already experienced within your launch, yeah. you're like, this is going to be it, and then you're like, shit, this is converting at thirty percent higher. No, now this yeah. is it, and then all of a sudden yeah. something else starts working or this drops off. So yeah, I mean, you do have to be be fairly nimble. I would say this. Um, if your conversion rate on your website isn't strong enough, there's two ways to tackle it. One is take a look at the content on your website and say, is this a powerful enough message to get people to say yes on the first attempt? Mm -hmm. And even to, even on top of that, I would say, even if it is, if you want to increase it, I would lead out with a, Hey, give us your email. You're not signing up for the app. You're not down. You're not getting the product. You don't need to use it. But if you sign up, we'll give you a checklist of ways that you can improve your personal finances today. Mm -hmm. How to audit, like it could be a worksheet, it could be something, but that they could tangibly use very quickly that would actually show them a result because then they have a trust in you. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking, when I'm thinking about I'm on the website and it's like the only option is to download the app, that's fine. But the process of me going through like being like, wait, is this going to be a lot of work? How many hours am I going to have to spend doing this? Is it actually going to save me time and money? Is this going to be a nightmare? Um, You might get their email if you give them a, hey, here's the top five ways or here's a worksheet to help map this or do this or whatever the the piece of value is. They would give you an email to get that starting point. And if it's something that they will get immediate result from, they can spend half an hour and be like, holy shit, this was really helpful. The net, when you email them in three days, being like, hey, do you want to try this app? They'll be like, yeah, you know what? Let's do it. And yeah. if nothing else, if you're delivering high quality content to your customers anyway, that these people that downloaded the PDF would appreciate, you can nurture those just free email followers into potential customers later or channel partner opportunities or whatever different stuff. So I wouldn't think about your customer as only people that download the app. Right. I would think about anybody that is interested and wants to follow up with you and hear your communication, whether that's like, you know, the, the weekly financial this or the bi-weekly financial that, and you're pointing out to, hey, here's a really cool podcast. Here's some other materials that we've made. Here's something from our blog. Here's our podcast. Um, you know, we've partnered with these guys. They're doing a giveaway to so tell your friends. Like there's so many opportunities to communicate with people. And I think um, who does it really well? Like companies like HubSpot, for example, mm-hmm. their content marketing is just delicious. <laughs> I don't know if it's delicious, but like I, da- I download everything they come out with and I just drool and I'm like, I wish I could be this good. I've never been a HubSpot customer. I, I may or may not ever be. I find their product to be good for some industries, but a little bit bulky in, in other ways. But like their sure. platform's 800 bucks a month. Yeah. Like it's like a $50 plan with really limited use and then it's $800 a month. So their target audience is pretty small. But I will say when you come in through one of their lead magnets, if I'm a small agency now and you've taught me the 72 page deck on how to create the most amazing LinkedIn ads and it actually worked, as my company grows, I'm going to consider one of your products, one of your services, or more importantly, if you've helped me and then my friend's like, man, I'm trying to figure out what CRM to go with. You're like, you should check out HubSpot. Because yeah. like-minded people hang out together and they, people want recommendations and referrals. So if you become a super fan, even though I'm not going to go through the process of using the app, you're just an amazing content provider. And I'm looking forward to your weekly financial digest for whatever, like you can win customers and grow that way. So I would really not discount people that just getting their email through a high quality piece of content and then eventually nursing them in. And, and again, you may run into a situation where you say, they never download the app, but all of a sudden you bring in a thing that's like, hey, do you travel a lot? Like this is a, this is a credit card that we recommend. We've researched our customers like it. And that has an affiliate link out where you're monetizing anyway. Like someone in your mm-hmm. email list could be a bigger LTV than someone that's using the app. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So content, a lot of like high quality, high impact content that you, get some feedback, find out what they want to know and just go to the ends of the earth to make high quality shit for them. And they will, um, they will be, people will be your advocate, even if they're not a direct customer. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's, that's really cool. It's, a, it's an awesome approach. And I, I like uh, something kind of clicked in my head as you were talking about the HubSpot example um, about referring your friends to it. I mean, like it, it's neat too, that in that model, 
even if that friend doesn't become a HubSpot customer, if if they're downloading that PDF and, and being represented value immediately as well, then they're kind of in this self-fulfilling loop as well. So it's, it's, it's really cool how you're approaching that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I've seen in the app space, um, I've seen Google app download ads work decently well, like the interstitial stuff, but you, mm-hmm. you have to be really clever. Basically you have to do something dramatically different. So a lot mm-hmm. of people now are showing like the, the scenes of the game being played or whatever, but there are some that are doing really well in that they're like, you know, it's a split screen between like a person and then the gameplay and like there's something funny going on. It's like, it's not just, it's not just the screen. Um, and so, you know, whether that's a client testimonial that's like, you know, using this product, da 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 and your, your banner app is like, you know, a, is like the, is the screen of the actual app going through. And then all of a sudden, like this text flows across being like, these guys changed my life from whatever. Like yeah. think about ways that are not just the standard interstitial ads. Cause most people yeah. are lazy. Most people show either gameplay or whatever, but like get creative with how you talk about it. Mm. Um, so I would think about that. Um, you know, even Facebook ads and Instagram ads have an app install type of campaign rather than yep. a traffic campaign. So I would play with that a little bit. One thing to keep in mind with Facebook and Instagram is as, as you load your, so you can load your customer data into it. Mm-hmm. So like, here's all the emails of my customers. And then it's like, cool. I know who they are on Facebook. You can make lookalike audiences of these. I think we talked about this. And when yeah. you create a lookalike audience of a, someone who's gone through the entire process and has transacted with you, look alike down app downloaders or whatever you know what i mean they that has the ability to scale and continue to drive your costs down versus like driving traffic ads to your website and never right. optimizing it for a transaction when as soon as you start optimizing for a conversion um that's when the magic of facebook and instagram actually starts working um so it's like you always want to measure conversions with the pixel so app downloads or whatever then you want to say to Facebook, Hey, I've got seven or 800 of these people. Can you go find more people like that? It's called a lookalike audience. So you, right. in your, your audiences tab, you uh, create an, uh, create a lookalike based on people that have become a client. Then you start giving it that. And then your cost starts to come down Yeah, constantly. And I've seen, you know, we've, we've dropped, uh, we've dropped acquisition costs by as, by as big as 90% whether it be PDF download, whether it be purchases on a website. Um, you know, we, we did some work with a dance bag company and they were paying like 84, $87 acquisitions. We got it down to like 14 and then we just dumped a bunch of money in and it was like amazing. Um, but even, even with our downloaded stuff, like if we just pick a, if we pick a general audience, we wait for the first 30 or 40 or 50 or 80 people to download it. We were getting downloads of our content at like, at one point it was like $3 and 67 cents, which is not scalable. Um, yeah, now yeah. we have it like, we have it like well under 80 cents now. And now we're like, cool. Now we're getting for the, you know, we're for a fifth of the price. We're getting the same action and the same level of quality. Like this can scale, this can go in. So thinking about lookalike audiences, cause you haven't, you'll have enough conversion data quickly cause you're, it's an easier path to entry. It's not, and it's not like a real estate agent where they can't, track it to a conversion and it's such a long cycle. yours is like oh this looks helpful or not bring it in just be cognizant when you're doing that of making sure that the downloads that are coming from those ads originally are sticking in the app are not like downloading it and then never signing up or downloading it and then fucking off because optimizing for people that are willing to download but don't actually become customers can be dangerous so be very cognizant of who you know are we getting good sign up all the way through the process and see mm-hmm. which channels are providing that like stickiness of the product and, and go all yeah. in on that. That's wow. <laughs> That's an awesome story. I, I love, I love, uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how, how much you've been able to been able to drive your CAC down uh, using that kind of one key tool. It's, it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's the magic of it. And it's so funny as a Facebook marketer, like, we don't know how it works. We just know. It works. <laughs> we just keep putting money in. Yeah. And it keeps working. We're like, okay. And then sometimes yeah. it breaks and you got to like adjust it. But yeah, it's like the lookalike audience, like what the fuck is that? You don't know. <laughs> we just know yeah, just that works. 
we just know that optimizing for it as soon as possible is the yeah. best thing to drive down your result. And whatever, <laughs> it continues to work five and a half years later. So we just keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. This is something else that you said during there that, that kind of uh, had a, a thought trigger in my mind as well when you're talking about the different kinds of creatives and the fact that people are getting more creative with their creative creatives now. It's almost like there's a, an inflation on creative content itself. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think about um, working with a creative agency for, for a small startup that has a, a relatively uh, restricted budget? Yeah. Is that something I mean, that you would, you would kind of get, get into early conversations with or, or, um, or hold, off, hold off on as, as long as possible? You know? it, it really depends on what the actual budget is and like yeah. how you have to meet certain targets. I mean, I think if you guys you know, put your head in the middle of a thing and said, okay, we're going to find a couple of freelance animators or video people. Mm -hmm. And like, we're going to come up with these three or four concepts and we're just going to use them as a test. And if that starts working, then go up to the next level. When you get into a creative agency, um, the truth is, and the challenge always becomes, if you don't have money that can go to zero, it's mm -hmm. really hard to do it. Um, because if, so say it costs 20 grand to make four little videos, then it's like, okay, and that's a fifth of our budget or a quarter of our budget. Like if those don't, if those don't pull, if those don't take, uh, it becomes a challenge. So, you know, waiting till you can have, you know, 15 to 20 grand go to zero without it like crushing you is probably when yeah. I would wait to do that. Um, and I would kind of go the freelance and like, cause you don't know, right. You don't know, you have no scale yet of like what people respond to. So you could say like, Hey, mix, you know, go on Fiverr, have 10 people make some random thing with like stock footage. Just, Hey, mm -hmm. come up with something funny, run them all. See if like one or two styles is like really hitting. And then if you've got a style of creative or like a concept that people flock to, then maybe invest beyond that. But I think right. early stage, testing when you don't really know what your customer wants and how they pull. Uh, I, th I think it's too early for you. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, this goes along with the, the theme of what you said before, which is early stages. We're really kind of trying to be as agile as possible, see what sticks. Um, mm -hmm. And if Fiverr is the answer that, that gives us 10 different things that we can try out, then that's probably a great strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, man. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate uh, you sharing your story. Um, I will link up everything, but where, uh, where's the best place for everyone to find you and go down? Uh, you can find us at yup.ca. That's just yupp.ca, or you can check out the app on the Apple app store. Just search you up in, in the app store and you're, you're going to find it for sure. And it's why you, anyone... why, why you PP two P that's right. Why you PP. Exactly. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to learn from you. Uh, I, I think, Someone once told me that you're the, the marketing guru of Toronto. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to have an opportunity to chat things through. <laughs> I, I certainly did not say that, but if someone said that, <laughs> about me, I, I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks.